This is Duke University. The second piece I'm going to read is much shorter, and I'm reading it partially in honor of Duncan's introduction and uh, CDS's history with AG and Let Us Now Praise Famous Men. Um, I am so obsessed with that book that I have, in fact, written several pieces about it, the piece Duncan quoted from, and, uh, and this piece as well, which is a more personal piece about the first time I ever read that book and what I felt when I did. It's called The Broken Heart of James Agee. Many nights that autumn, I went to a bar where the floor was covered with peanut shells, and I drank, and I read James Agee. Liquor carried his vision of trauma all through me, twisted me, pliable to the loss, and I wasn't afraid to think like this, pliable to the loss, because I was drunk, and drunk meant sentiment was not only permissible, but imperative. It was boundless. Turns out, Let Us Now Praise Famous Men wasn't about famous men. It was about bedbugs and mildewed bridal caps and farmhouses like cracked nipples on the land. It was about how A.G. wanted to fuck one of the women he was writing about. Also, it was about guilt. Mainly, it was about guilt. Originally, it was a magazine article gone rogue. In 1936, Fortune magazine told A.G. to write a journalistic piece about sharecroppers in the Deep South, and he gave them a spiritual dark night of the soul instead. They rejected it. He wrote another 400 pages. It's a hard book to classify. It's got sections that don't seem to belong together, discussions of cotton prices and denim overalls and the soul as an angel nailed to a cross. It uses colons somewhat like this sentence does, rabidly. It's so long-winded and beautiful, you want to shake it by the bones of its gorgeous shoulders and make it stop. But the difficulty of closure is one of its obsessions, the endlessness of labor and hunger. It's trying to tell a story that won't end. I was trying, at the time I read it, to tell a story of my own. I'd recently returned to America after living in Nicaragua, where I'd been robbed and punched in the face one night, drunk. My nose had been broken, then partly fixed by an expensive surgeon in Los Angeles. I'd moved to New Haven, where it seemed like someone was always getting mugged. I was afraid to walk alone in the dark. Nearly all is cruelly stained, A.G. wrote, in the tensions of physical need. There's a notion we absorb about suffering, that it should expand us, render us porous. But this didn't happen to me. I felt shrunk. Damage became fear. It became an insistence. I read A.G. thinking about his own guilt when he was supposed to be thinking about three Alabama families, and I thought about myself when I was supposed to be thinking about A.G. Or else, I thought of everyone who wasn't me, back on the streets of Granada. I thought of the boys I'd tutored some afternoons, glue-addicted and homeless, with their runny noses and loose pants, catching them as they prowled the cantinas of Calle Calzada, looking for money and company. I thought of Luis, who'd fallen asleep on the steps of the home where I lived, and how I hadn't invited him inside at night, only woken him up, nudged his shoulder, because he was blocking the door. I inspected this memory for the shown seams of a moral. What should I have done? Maybe A.G. kept writing because he was looking for the stitching of a moral, too. Maybe that's why he couldn't stop. I loved getting sad about A.G. because his sadness wasn't mine. My face was claustrophobic and A.G. was something else. He was something I wasn't. Tragedy is secondhand. Faulkner wrote that which meant, to me, families in Alabama hurt more than I ever would, and I could show up at a dingy bar and admit that. This wasn't enough, but it was something. A.G. felt this about his own book. It wasn't enough, but it was something. He writes of a woman's daily work in the cotton fields. 
How is it possible to be made clear enough, the many processes of wearying effort which make the shape of each one of her living days, how is it to be calculated the number of times she has done these things, the number of times she is still to do them? How conceivably in words is it to be given as it is in actuality, the accumulated weight of these actions upon her and what this accumulation has made of her body and what it has made of her mind and of her heart and of her being? Empathy is contagion. A.G. catches it and passes it to us. He wants his words to stay in us as deepest and most iron anguish and guilt. They have stayed. They do stay. They catch as splinters still in the open, supplicating palms of this essay. If it were possible, A.G. claims, he wouldn't have used words at all. If I could do it, he writes, I'd do no writing at all here. In this way, we are prepared for the 400 pages of writing that follow. A piece of the body torn out by the roots, he continues, might be more to the point. A.G. doesn't offer actuality. He only wonders what this actuality might look like, an adequate description, what this accumulation has made, and suspends that possibility in the margins of his book, everything he can't manage. On the question of poverty and its effect on consciousness, he is merciless. The brain is quietly drawn and quartered. His book does the same to its story, slicing it to pieces and putting it back together in fragments. The house, the dawn, the animals, the men, communism, children. He calls his work the effort to perceive simply the cruel radiance of what is. What is, it seems, was broken. So A.G. broke his book to fit. Subject holds structure in its thrall. Poverty pulls apart consciousness, dissolved into bodily necessity and stricture, and A.G. pulls apart narrative, drawn and quartered. He doesn't think he'll do his subjects justice. I feel sure in advance that any efforts in what follows along the lines I have been speaking of will be failures. He chokes on his words interrupted by the commas and clauses of his own apologies. He stutters here. He stutters often. I found it hard to talk about getting hurt. I kept trying to make it something larger than itself, that single moment in the street, to make it part of a pattern. The easiest pattern was guilt. My hand had been on a sleeping boy's shoulder, shaking him awake. What does concrete make you dream? I dream of that boy in circles. I dream of where my hand was. I could think forever about the man who hit me, how little he had, most likely, and how big a difference it might have made to him to sell my little digital camera wherever he sold my little digital camera. That camera I would have given him easily just to keep his hand from striking my face. A.G. went somewhere to look at poverty and tried to take the damage onto himself, to strip away its metaphors and get to some clean, torn truth beneath. The literal feeling by which the words a broken heart are no longer poetic, but are merely the most accurate possible description. What was broken in me that fall wasn't poetry. My face wasn't useful as metaphor or aperture. It was only the accurate description of where hand had been. What good is guilt? A.G. asked. We ask. We like the sound of the question. It puts a crude finger on a heartbeat in us that won't stop racing, a pulse broken in sympathy. It makes us talk. It makes us talk about ourselves. It makes us confess. We want to purge something that even confession won't justify, that sleeping boy. A.G. drank when he wrote, and I drank when I read him. A.G. threw himself at the feet of his subjects, and I couldn't even bring myself to walk alone at night 
with my bone broken nose and my vodka flung and fluttering heart. You get drunk and then you get sentimental or else you get drunk and get hit. I told myself there was something dense and meaningful in my fear, an earned experience, the residue of contact, a cruel radiance, but truly there was nothing but my arms crossed over my chest as I walked on empty streets and no one coming after me in the dark. And that's what I've got. Um.